very glad to be speaking with uh, Don Kelf from CEU, who's been at a workshop on populism with us and discussing what is populism. And you were in a certain way even expressing some kind of skepticism about the term. Um, can we actually use the term? I mean, is it is it something which helps us to to understand uh, politics in let's say post-communist Europe, which you know you've worked more on the northern tier, so to speak, yeah. and we're focusing in the south? It's it's in fact a difficult question huh? because mm. it's. Uh, the term populism is around. It's, it's being used all the time. So in that sense, saying that we cannot use it academically probably makes no sense. Mm. And apparently it sort of, it speaks to a particular need. Mm. This term that is needed, that is very flexible, that is not substantive, but alludes to particular formal aspects of political process within democratic societies. And populism seems to fill that up. Mm. So I mean, yeah, since Laclau moved this great theory of populism in terms of populism uh, as something that is being organized around an empty signifier. But of course, populism itself is perhaps the largest empty signifier. Mm -hmm. and um, so I don't think we can evade it. You want to cut it down all the time, mm -hmm. uh, use it as precisely as possible. I don't think we can really launch a theory of populism uh, because it is such a shifting target. Um, so, so yeah, so don't speak about it by speaking about it all the time, but that's, that's what we basically do. Um, my own strategy in this is sort of gut feeling, I think, more than, than a fully elaborated methodological position, um, where you assume that, that populism are all those acts by which, um, by which the the outcomes of capitalist process in the region, but you know, capitalist process basically anywhere in the global north, I guess, or in the world, um, are being displaced onto culturalized mm -hmm. vocabularies, culturalized vocabularies of, of the trustability of persons, of the moral quality of persons, um, etc. So, so populism as a, as a stylistic element that allows you to speak about things that the political system do not really allow you to speak about because the political system can really deal with it, right? Capitalism as a, as a globalized process um, that produces all sorts of, uh, of, of agonistic outcomes over time in particular territories, but within these particular territories, you sort of keep thinking that it has something to do with yourself and it has something to do with your own political system or your own political representatives. And so you try to talk about things that you don't really, in the absence of an intelligent, updated Marxism, you don't have a language for, and then you articulate them within a national field of vocabularies and, and orient them towards your national representatives within, uh, within democratic arenas, um, and, and look at their particular moral qualities and sort of try to identify the moral qualities that are failing. So the corruption concept becomes the big concept, basically, I think, of all, uh, of all populisms. Um, yeah, so that's the sort of maneuver. It's a sort of maneuver that's happening. I mean, what you're suggesting with that is also to some degree that it's diffusing or converting, let's say, socioeconomic grievances into another framework. Yes. Because most of populism talks about, as you said, values, nation, yeah. protecting yeah. us. Yeah. And it doesn't usually talk about protecting workers or protecting yeah. um, people who feel like they're, they're becoming precarious in their, in their yeah. workplace, but rather saying, ah, it's the, it's the outsider, whoever it may be, who's threatening you. So in that sense, you can yeah. argue that populism is actually uh, diffusing and also a negative phenomena because it, it shifts attention away from maybe uh, real existing um, social grievances and economic grievances. Yeah, yeah exactly. So it's a, it's a culturalization. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the way I think the anthropology have started to phrase it. It's sort of culturalization of socioeconomic grievances. But then again, do we really want to separate culture and, and economics and social issues so well? Um, I'm a little bit hesitant about that. And so I'm, I'm really interested in, as an anthropologist, um, not so much in, in separating economics and culture out and politics out, but just looking at, at social reproduction. I think social reproduction is the key concept for for a reinvigorated leftist critique of capitalism rather than, let us say, our relationship to modes of production or, or our riparian class positionship. Uh, but 
social reproduction as a set of as a set of practices by which we reproduce ourselves over time. And, and people know that social reproduction has become more difficult for in, in many respects and for many groups, but the groups themselves are very fleeting. That's also part of the problem. You, you can't easily define your class position in that sense. We have of course to do with with middle classes that are that are de de bourgeois de bourgeoisifying. Mm. Um, and becoming precarious themselves, and so it's a very, very blurred situation. And it's precisely because that, that situation is so blurred and so fuzzy that these culturalist vocabularies can become can seem to become so significant, right? right? So they seem to capture something about what is really happening to you, um, but by being so much focused on on the moral qualities of the actors within national democracy, it fails to see that. These are actually global processes where the real drivers behind it are not national at all, very often. I mean, you were pointing out, or somewhat critical of uh, focusing too much on discourse and looking at discourse of these groups. Um, and yeah. so, so it's, a, it's a question of, you know, as an anthropologist, how do you methodologically approach the study of this phenomena? How would you go about this um, to, to better understand that these dynamics? That again, I think, is a very difficult issue, in fact, because, of course, we as anthropologists tend to just talk to people. Right? That, that's basically our method. Talk to people and be with them, as long as you can. And so know them as roundabout people with particular histories and particular trajectories and know how other people are talking about them, etc., etc. Um, so I think that is, that is the standard methodology for doing this, too. You talk to people. And, and you talk to people about their social reproduction. And so you see all sorts of processes and trajectories there. But of course, I'm totally aware that there is something like media framing going on. Where people pick up bits of pieces of, of empty signifiers and, and less empty signifiers from the media in order to, uh, to interpret their own situation or express it. So it's that sort of dialectical process where let us say all sorts of quasi-organic intellectuals in the Marxian sense are producing sound bites that seem significant or relevant to people in order to clarify processes in their own life and then are being appropriated and re-articulated. So it's that sort of dialectical process that you try to get at, which is of course ultimately methodologically not, not really possible, right? because it's a very, very different ways of, of doing research. Um, and I don't think you can ever really, really track that over time. But I think the anthropological position would be very much to emphasize that, that media framing is important. And so if you have sort of populist processes, if you want to call them like that, in, in the political sphere going on, then people would certainly hook on to that and, and reinterpret it. But I think the anthropological position is trying to bring this back to particular experiences, particular realities in people's own lives. <coughs> Well, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. And it's a pleasure. Yeah.